Chapter 19, Countering the Urban Sniper No easy answer. There is no simple solution for the problem presented by the urban guerrilla sniper. What works in one situation, environment, or time period may not work in another. Importantly, a security force or population will remain vulnerable to attack no matter what they do if they are ignorant of guerrilla sniper methodology. Ultimately, the only way to defeat or limit the guerrilla sniper is to study and understand them. Checkpoints and Guard Towers Any uniformed soldier or police officer is a potential target for a guerrilla sniper. Security personnel are a target by the mere fact that they wear a uniform identifying who they are. And due to various activities uniformed police and soldiers have to perform, such as walking patrols and manning checkpoints, they are doubly vulnerable. The urban environment is so complex, security forces have no hope of eliminating all potential threats. However, the probability of effective sniper attacks can be significantly reduced. First, let us tackle the problem of static security positions like checkpoints and guard towers. Any uniformed person who stands in the same spot in the open day after day is vulnerable to sniper attack. The Juba sniper video, as we studied in a previous chapter, reveals that static security positions are quite vulnerable. It does not matter if the soldier is sticking their head out of the hatch of a tank or standing in an open guard tower. They are victims waiting to happen. If a uniformed soldier has to man a static position, they must protect themselves using either cover or concealment. To defeat the threat of PLO snipers, the Israelis built sniper-proof surveillance towers which they used to monitor the surrounding terrain. These towers were completely enclosed with bulletproof glass and other bulletproof materials like steel and concrete. From these towers, Israeli soldiers could look out, but no bullets could get in. A completely bulletproof structure is one way to protect a static guard post. Another technique is to construct a guard post that completely conceals anyone inside. For example, a guard tower can be covered with hemi camouflage netting so the people inside can see and shoot out, but snipers cannot see in. Urban counter snipers used a similar technique for years. When a counter sniper team is required to fire from inside a building, they hang sheer netting from the ceiling to the floor, covering a window or open area they want to shoot from. From a distance, this netting looks like a solid wall. The snipers, who are close to the netting, can see and shoot through it. A variation of the netting method is using a solid material like sheets to conceal oneself from a sniper. After John Muhammad and Lee Malvo began killing people in the D.C. area, local gas stations hung bed sheets around their gas pumps. This way, customers could drive up to the gas station pass through a wall of bed sheets, and then stop next to a gas pump while they were surrounded by the sheets. Of course, these sheets would not stop a bullet, but they did not have to since they concealed everything behind them. Hitting anyone behind the wall of sheets would be a matter of pure luck. Security forces establishing temporary checkpoints on roads can use this same methodology. These checkpoint teams can bring with them on each patrol camouflage netting and the necessary material for hanging them. When they get to their location, they hang the netting around their position. In this manner, the cars and people to be searched enter a completely enclosed and camouflaged position, effectively isolating them from observation from a sniper. After the cars and people are searched or questioned, they exit the enclosed checkpoint and go back into the open and on their way. Body Armor Body armor is another defensive measure that saves lives and makes a sniper's job harder. However, the capabilities and limitations of the body armor worn must be taken into consideration. For example, soft body armor, commonly worn by police officers, only stops bullets fired from pistols. Level 3A soft body armor, which is standard issue for most police departments, will stop up to a 44 Magnum pistol round, but nothing larger. In order for a person to be protected from a rifle round, they must wear hard armor, either made of steel or ceramic plate. Level 4 hard body armor is designed to stop 6 7.62 mm rounds and still protect the wearer. A soldier can also wear a protective helmet, but even the most modern Kevlar helmets will only stop a 9 mm pistol round because they only provide level 3A 
not level 4 protection. Consequently, a 5.56mm rifle round will go clean through a Kevlar helmet. A soldier wearing a protective helmet can only hope it will deflect an imperfectly aimed incoming rifle round because the helmet will not stop a dead-on shot. Even level 4 body armor can be defeated with armor-piercing ammunition or weapons like the big 50 caliber guns, so they should not be relied on to stop a sniper. To be sure, body armor makes a sniper's job more difficult because they will most likely be forced to shoot around the armor at a much smaller body part like the pelvis or head. Foot patrols. Soldiers conducting foot patrols in the open are less vulnerable than those conducting static checkpoints because they are moving. A checkpoint can be studied for days on end to engineer the perfect attack. In contrast, a foot patrol is a dynamic element able to take different routes every day and change their course at any moment to thwart ambush. However, foot patrols are still targeted by urban snipers simply because they are in the open. If a patrol takes the same route every day, they too are setting a pattern that can be studied and exploited by a patient shooter. The sniper's job may be more difficult and require a more flexible plan of attack, but some snipers prefer moving target when the urban terrain works in their favor. As discussed previously, British foot patrols in Northern Ireland were favorite targets for IRA snipers. IRA sniper teams would observe an approaching British patrol with a system of lookouts that included school-aged children and housewives. From the information received from the lookouts, the sniper team could predict the patrol's route. The sniper team would set up in a location to ambush the patrol at an intersection. Patrols were at a disadvantage when crossing an intersection because a shot could come from any direction. In response, British patrols routinely ran through intersections so a waiting sniper would have a fleeting target. They also developed techniques where they covered all avenues of approach leading into an intersection so if a sniper took a shot, someone was bound to see it. The British also used multiple patrols working together to thwart snipers. The idea was one element would move while another element provided cover from an elevated position like the roof of a building. Then the team switched duties and the first element provided cover while the other team moved. These sniper-savvy tactics were designed to defeat a sniper attack before it ever happened because if an IRA sniper saw a patrol employing effective counter-sniper tactics, they preferred to target a different, less vigilant patrol. Preventative measures. People who operate in the open can limit their expo exposure in other ways. Since we know snipers key in on lucrative targets like officers, radio operators, forward observers, close air support controllers, and other snipers, these people must conceal their identities from potential snipers. For instance, officers should not wear rank visible from a distance. Superiors should not be saluted in the open. This is what soldiers call a sniper check. And people should not give deference to their leaders in any manner detectable from a distance because as a sniper searches for potential targets, they will look at body language like standing in attention for a superior to identify a person of rank. Other key people, like radio operators, must conceal their radios and their duties. A communicator walking in the open with a radio on their back and an antenna sticking into the air is a dead man if a sniper sees him. Radio operators should conceal their radios in day packs and use non-traditional modes of communication as opposed to their long whip antennas. Communicators should consider weaving flexible whip or coax cable antennas into their gear or consider using more concealable means of communications like walkie-talkies, cell, and satellite phones. Or while on patrol, a communicator can move into a structure or an alley during a security halt, pull out their gear, and then make their communication in a covert manner. The goal for soldiers operating in the open is concealment of information to hide their rank, specific duties, and any special equipment or weapons to deny potential snipers an easy time of picking their targets. Ideally, everyone in a patrol should look as uniform as possible so no single person sticks out as more important than another. The patrol should start to act more like the guerrillas they are fighting, so the waiting sniper has a difficult time identifying who is who and who does what. There are many commercially available undercover equipment rigs for sale designed to be worn under a jacket to conceal ammunition, weapons, and equipment like radios. A unit can still conceal their equipment and weapons on their person, yet adhere to the laws of land warfare. This is a difficult thing to do for conventional militaries and police units because they are used to operating overtly, 
in either rural terrain, like the military, or in permissive, relatively peaceful environments, like the police. Units should consider training their men to change their rank-oriented overt cultures to deny snipers a unit-paralyzing shot. Warnings for soldiers and the populace. In the chaotic world of the modern battlefield, nothing can be taken for granted. It only makes sense military units, policemen, and concerned citizens make an effort to warn others of the threat of enemy snipers. In World War II, all sides posted sniper warning signs, cautioning their own soldiers of the presence of enemy snipers, as if they were warning people of falling rocks or bridge ice before road. This is because soldiers working a specific trench or neighborhood knew the threats in their area, but soldiers from rear supply units or from other organizations were oblivious to the threat of enemy snipers unless someone told them. In a business where ignorance can be death, it paid to inform your comrades. In Stalingrad, for example, both Germans and Russians put up warning signs informing their men of particularly dangerous areas of the city. While the IRA put up their infamous sniper at work signs in Northern Ireland to intimidate British controls, the signs also served to warn both the enemy and fellow citizens a guerrilla sniper team was working in the area. In Beirut, during the Civil War from 1975 to 1990, local radio stations announced the latest sniper activity to the city residents, cautioning them on where to go and not to go, like they were passing along a traffic report. This public courtesy allowed the various people living in the war-torn city to buy their groceries, get gas, and billet relatives without taking a bullet along the way. The same was true of the besieged city of, of Sarajevo, where the locals posted Pazi sniper signs in order to warn uninformed citizens they were approaching Sniper's Alley or some other hazardous killing zone. Vehicles People traveling in vehicles may be less vulnerable to a sniper attack because of the protection provided by the vehicle and the fact they are moving. Conversely, in some cases, people in a vehicle may actually be more vulnerable to a sniper because they are a bigger target. Certainly, a regular, unarmored vehicle creates problems for a shooter. A car's windshield is thick and may deflect a bullet. Also, shooting through a car door may deflect and fragment a bullet, depending on the type of round fired and the weapon used. As a result, precision shooting through a car adds difficulties for the sniper. However, a trained sniper can still shoot through a vehicle and hit their target. For instance, President Kennedy was shot in the throat by a high-velocity bullet that first went through the front windshield, was deflected downwards due to the angle of the glass, and then found its mark. Snipers can also anticipate the negative effects of shooting through a vehicle by employing large-caliber weapons that will go through a car door or windshield with little deflection. For example, a 50 caliber sniper rifle will penetrate a car door, a windshield, and even a car seat. If a person is concerned with using a vehicle for protection from sniper attacks, they need an armored car with bulletproof glass and armor-plated doors. An armored vehicle can take many forms, such as a regular car like a Mercedes or BMW, modified to protect its occupants while appearing to be normal from the outside, or overtly armored cars can be used. The British police in Northern Ireland routinely drove armored Land Rovers for protection. In other wars, like those in Iraq and Chechnya, the conventional military forces employed heavily armored fighting vehicles like armored trucks, armored personnel carriers, and tanks. We should remember guerrilla snipers in Iraq on one occasion shot through the 2-inch thick armored windshield of an American armored truck with a 50 caliber sniper rifle, hitting a soldier inside. A person who rides in an armored vehicle but exposes themselves outside the vehicle are still vulnerable to attack. As mentioned previously, during the Battle of Stalingrad, one of the greatest threats to German panzers was Russian snipers. Targeting an armored vehicle is an inherently effective technique for a sniper because the only person in the crew who has a chance to see where the shot came from is already dead. Consequently, despite a tank's massive firepower, they are relatively toothless when a careless crew member exposes themselves to a sniper. Military organizations thus face the challenge of manufacturing armored vehicles that allow crew members to observe their surroundings without exposing themselves to snipers. Civilian armored cars with a normal complement of windows allow obser observation in all directions, giving the occupants good situational awareness. One armored vehicle produced by South Africa, the RG-31 Cougar, has a balance between good armor and a good observation because the vehicle has bulletproof windows and gun ports 
allowing observation in all direction. Another dilemma faced by soldiers traveling in vehicles is they need to defend themselves against more than just snipers. They have to defend themselves against RPG attacks, roadside bombs, complex ambushes, and the like. Vehicles like the American Humvee employ a roof-mounted gunner's protection, but this leaves the gunner exposed to snipers. Newer versions of the Humvee have remotely controlled gun systems on the roof, enabling the crew to return fire in all directions without anyone exposing themselves to enemy fire. A downside to this new Humvee is the occupants are crammed inside their claustrophobic truck, so they have less situational awareness. A vehicle like this may be more secure from sniper attack, but is more vulnerable to other threats like IEDs and RPGs. An effective vehicle must balance protection for both snipers and other more lethal threats. Get out of the kill zone. When a person comes under fire by a sniper, they must take immediate action to reduce their vulnerability. The first thing a person under fire should do is take cover. For, in for instance, a single individual can, can get off the street and into an armored vehicle. A squad of soldiers can seek cover in a nearby building. It is one of the utmost importance the targeted person or persons leave the immediate area and get out of the sniper's line of fire. Since a sniper usually establishes a position allowing them to focus on a specific location, moving out of the sniper's kill zone may be all it takes. Of course, there are exceptions to every rule, and we must remember Charles Whitman was able to shoot people in all directions from atop the Texas Tower. In that case, some of Whitman's victims thought they were moving to a safer area when in fact they were only exposing themselves more. Immediate action drills must take into account a member of a patrol may be shot with the sniper's first bullet, so... As a group of men react to the sniper's first shot and find cover, a member of the team may be caught in the open because they are dead or wounded. In fact, a sniper may intentionally wound a patrol member to lure other members out and into the open who are in turn shot. A common method of dealing with this problem is the use of hand-thrown smoke grenades to block a sniper's view of their target if a member of a patrol is shot by a sniper. Their teammates take cover, throw smoke grenades to obscure the sniper's field of vision, and then rescue their wounded mate while under the cover of smoke. The smoke is not bulletproof, but it is the equivalent of hanging bed sheets around a gas pump. A sniper would have to get lucky to make a shot through the smoke in order to hit someone. Battlefield Detectives Once the targeted person reacts to the initial sniper attack, they must become battlefield detectives. The first thing battlefield detectives do is determine from what direction the sniper fired from. The direction may be determined from a combination of things to include the sound of the gunshot, observable muzzle, blast, and flash, and the impact of the bullet itself. Once the direction is determined and the distance to the sniper is estimated. This can also be deduced from a variety of clues like the time between hearing the supersonic crack of the bullet and hearing the actual gunshot, the force of impact of the bullet, and likely places the sniper could be hiding. If a person sees the bullet's impact and hears the gunshot simultaneously, then the sniper is probably 300 meters or closer. If a person sees the bullet impact first, or hears the supersonic crack first, and then the gunshot, the shooter is further away, maybe 500 meters or more. Trying to determine the sniper's distance from sound alone creates problems because so many variations come into play. What speed is the bullet traveling? What is the speed of sound at your location and elevation? Is a sniper using a suppressor or subsonic ammunition? Another important element for determining the sniper's direction and distance is the angle of the bullet. A bullet striking at a severe angle must have been fired from a tall structure, while a bullet striking a target at a perpendicular angle must have been fired from a street-level position. A common method of backtracking the azimuth of a shot is to stick a weapon cleaning rod in a hole made by the bullet and see where the rod points. In Stalingrad, Vasily Zaitsev would hold up a helmet or mitten with a board to get enemy snipers to shoot through it. Once they shot the board, Vasily had the board up and looked back through the hole and directly at where the shot came from. After evaluating the probable direction, distance, and angle the shot was made from, the battlefield detective makes an educated guess where the sniper is located. Once a location is determined, the Targeted persons evaluate the assets available to them and choose a course of action based on the environment they are operating in. If the security forces are operating in an environment of extremist restraint, 
such as the British in Northern Ireland or American law enforcement in the United States, then the targeted persons have limited options. An acceptable response would be surrounding the suspected sniper to capture them as they flee or to kill the gunman up close to limit collateral damage. If security forces succeed in surrounding the sniper, they still must identify the suspected shooter. This requires them to separate the guilty party from the surrounding innocent people. The responding security forces can only do this if they have the proper tools like gunshot residue detection kits, dogs trained in detecting gunpowder, and the ability to effectively question potential eyewitnesses to gather incriminating testimony. The importance of restraint. Soldiers and police fighting a guerrilla war must understand restraint and thorough investigations are the best way to defeat the urban guerrilla sniper. This is especially true when a sniper fires from a populated area to get an overreaction from security forces. The sniper wants the security forces to respond with artillery barrages, airstrikes, and tank shells so they kill innocent civilians and destroy their own city. Every time security forces overreact with massive firepower, they provide prime propaganda for the guerrilla's cause, alienate the people from the government, and increase the cost of repairing their own city. What the guerrilla sniper fears most is an educated response backed up with a relentless investigation into the shooting. A guerrilla wants their victims to shoot at everything around them that moves. This kind of emotional, knee-jerk reaction makes their job easier. In contrast, a trained, disciplined, educated patrol will quickly take cover and analyze the impact of the bullet to determine its back azimuth. Once a rough azimuth is determined, the patrol sets up counter snipers and scans for the enemy. The patrol sets up a video camera and films the surrounding area for later use as evidence and to closely study the terrain, like people coming to and from the sniper's suspected location. The patrol then moves from cover to cover towards the suspected shooter's location, questions people, and searches for incriminating evidence. The guerrilla sniper does not want to encounter this kind of patrol. <clears throat> If the targeted security forces are not operating under restraint, they may be able to kill the sniper using other methods. For example, <clears throat> if a patrol determines a sniper is in a particular building, security forces may want to destroy the entire building using heavy artillery, rocket launchers, attack helicopters, or precision aerial bombs. Always, Security forces must understand the use of unrestrained firepower to take out a single sniper will result in significant structural damage and possibly civilian deaths. In many wars, like Israel fighting in Lebanon in the 1980s and Germany fighting in Russia in World War II, the forces responding to an enemy sniper may not care about collateral damage. In fact, they may prefer to inflict disproportionate damage on the surrounding population in an attempt to deter future attacks. One must remember, when the Germans in Stalingrad pounded the city into ruins, they did not make the place any safer for Russian snipers. Just the opposite was true. The same could be said of the Russian destruction of Grozny and the American devastation of Fallujah. The rubbling of any urban area creates more sniper hides. In every situation, the responding forces must balance the destruction of infrastructure and the damage to the populace with the need to eliminate the sniper threat. Counter sniper teams. If massive force is ineffective or counterproductive, or a skilled sniper shows a superior tactical ability thwarting all attempts to locate and surround them, security forces may need to employ their own counter snipers to combat their unseen foe. A sniper team has some advantages as a counter sniper weapon because they understand the art of sniping, how the enemy operates, what their mindset is, and they know the tricks of the trade. Often, it takes a sniper to catch a sniper. In Stalingrad, Vasily Zaitsev and his specially trained snipers became a counter-sniper fire brigade. Whenever the hard-pressed Russians found themselves under the gun of an effective German sniper, they called in their own snipers to deal with the problem. Zaitsev and his fellow snipers were particularly effective in counter-sniper duties because they were skilled battlefield investigators and knew how to reverse-engineer the scene of a shooting to determine the enemy sniper's location. In most cases, a sniper team has a basic understanding of sniper forensics and can readily apply this knowledge on the battlefield. 
Once a sniper team is brought in to track down an enemy sniper, it becomes a battle of wits and tactical ability. Standard counter sniper methodology begins with determining the general area the enemy is operating in. Once this is known, the counter snipers use their own experience to narrow down where they think their enemy is positioned. Then the team sets up a clandestine hide where they can view the terrain. In short, the counter sniper team tries to out sniper their opponent who is using the same techniques against them. After the counter sniper team moves into position undetected, they observe the terrain and search for the enemy. The counter sniper team may catch their opponent moving to or from their sniper position, or the team may observe their opponent already set up in their position, unaware they are being stalked. Additionally, the enemy may reveal their position by exhibiting unnatural behavior. They might be seen with incriminating physical evidence, like holding a gun in their hands, or be exposed by a flash of light off their scope. If the team cannot find the sniper through observation alone, they might give their enemy bait and lure them into revealing their location. A classic baiting technique is showing the enemy sniper something to get them to fire a shot at, such as the top of a helmet or a stuffed dummy that looks like a human. The effort a counter sniper team makes to coax a shot from their enemy is limited only by their imaginations. During World War II, German snipers were taught to construct elaborate, lifelike dummies with paper mache heads and moving arms. They even placed a burning cigarette in the dummy's hand, moving the cigarette to the dummy's head by a string as if smoking, and then blew smoke through a straw attached to the dummy's head. From a distance, the dummy looked like a careless German sentry having a smoke. Once the sniper is coaxed into making a shot, the counter sniper team observes their enemy's muzzle flash and blast and responds in kind. This duel is truly a chess game because the sniper and counter sniper both try to reveal each other's positions through tricks, baits, and ruses. The superior thinker and tactician wins. In an urban environment, it is helpful for the counter sniper team to secure a dominant position, which in the city means an elevated one. From an elevated position, the counter sniper team can see more of the surrounding terrain and may be protected from enemy fire from a lower elevation. In Stalingrad, some of the best sniper positions were in the towering smokestacks in the northern factory district. The snipers positioned atop these chimneys did not have to worry about being outflanked by a sniper in a superior position. In Israel, the Israelis perfected the art of creating their own elevated positions by raising encased shooting platforms into the air high above the surrounding buildings dangling from the ends of heavy cranes. From these metal and glass boxes, the Israeli snipers had dominant bird's eye views of the urban terrain, helping them to better target their enemies. Law enforcement counter sniper teams all over the world routinely set up their positions atop the highest structures in the area so they have the best fields of observation. In the cities, a dominant sniper position may be atop an apartment building, a skyscraper, a radio tower, some scaffolding, or even a crane. Minimize the target. An important counter sniper tactic is simply limiting one's exposure to potential snipers. Do not stand in the middle of an intersection if you can stand behind a wall or car. Do not silhouette yourself by standing on the roof of a building when you can lie down behind an object like a water tank or a generator. Do not stand outside if you can be inside an armored vehicle or inside a building. Do not stand in front of a window or a doorway if you can stand to the side and still see outside. Do not stand in the light if you can stand in the shadows. In short, use all the possible protection available in an urban environment to limit a sniper's view of their potential target. An effective counter sniper tool used extensively in World War II on the Eastern Front was the unsung scissors periscope. The scissors periscope was used widely by artillery observations to call in fire and commanders to survey the battlefield in safety. As the war went on, both sides discovered the periscope was an excellent tool to observe the surrounding terrain, free from the fire of enemy snipers. On the German side, in Stalingrad, Panzer commanders used periscopes to look outside their tanks, and artillery observers, snipers, guard posts, and various leaders all used the periscope to observe the urban terrain while avoiding death at the hands of the omnipresent Russian snipers. The simple periscope can still be used today to achieve the same effects and limit exposure of soldiers in sniper-plagued areas. Soldiers in guard towers, vehicles, and sniper hides, as well as those on patrol, can all benefit from the trusty periscope. 
The periscope allows them to search for enemy snipers, conduct post-shooting assessments, and perform a myriad of battlefield duties in complete safety from a sniper's gaze. Today, there are good tactical periscopes available that are lightweight, affordable, and durable. Believe it or not, the excellent Russian trench periscope from World War II is still available today through surplus stores for as little as $100.